So it's uh, kind of nice to be back from my expedition. Uh, I'm eating a little better these days. Um, uh, but I had a lot of questions as to how I fared. So uh, first of all, not much luck eating rabbits because there wasn't enough snow. And, and now look at it about me. <laughs> uh, go figure that I'd get it after I return. Uh, but some things I learned, I mentioned I, I do learn every time I go out in experimental archaeology, I guess. Um, one of the things I do differently, um, uh, I would focus on my shelter the first day like I did. But the second day I would do nothing but cut firewood while I still had lots of energy. And... I would get firewood cut for four or five days, and that would would have allowed me to focus uh, entirely on on food foraging and hunting, and because cutting firewood each day for the for the following night took a lot of my time. So certainly do that differently. Um, I asked a lot about my clothes, and in a word, wool. Everything I wear from my inner trade shirt here, my inner layer, my intermediate layer, my my capote, my blankets, um, the linings of my moccasins, um, everything is made from 100% wool. Uh, it'll it'll keep you still slightly warm when it's wet, where most modern fabrics simply don't do that. Um, tad on the heavy side, but I'll never give up my wool, that's for sure. Uh, also, a number of comments on moccasins, and um, I'm going to be, uh, in the new year, I'm going to be making uh, a new pair of shoe packs, I'm going to be making a new pair of winter moccasins, and I'm going to make a new pair of summer moccasins. So I thought I'd film that and, and show people how I go about it. I don't use a pattern. Um, I, I have a mold. It's called my foot. So um, I'll demonstrate how I do that. Uh, if I do take measurements, I use my fingers or my joints and my fingers to sort of get a pattern roughed out before I finish it. Anyway, uh, back to my paddle and uh, I'll, I'll soon have wood dry enough. Now the um, uh, staves that I cut out for the cedar ribs are dry enough that I'm going to be able to throw them out uh, in a few days and I'll, I'll be getting at that canoe building. I have a new feature to my cabin and uh, yeah, I replicated this from, um, saw it in a museum, uh, it was sort of circa late 1600s and the uh, museum was rather reluctant to give up a 350 year old artifact. So I thought I'll go home and I'll build one myself. So it was rough, rough hewn out of a chunk of hardwood. So I used a piece of walnut here. And so the Hudson Bay Company and, and a wee bit of history there. So it was chartered in May, uh, on May the 2nd, 1670. And basically, they were, the company was granted uh, exclusive rights to all the watersheds that flowed into the Hudson Bay. And um, this massive land expanse became known as Rupert's Land. So if, if, the, if it was just a trading post, it was called a fort. If it had the word factory following it, it meant that the chief factor resided there or the chief trading partner. And so they broke it up into districts. So, for example, Moose Factory, uh, York Factory, Churchill Factory, those, those would have had a chief factor living there. And so this might, that might have been on some chief factor's house or the, the reproduction of this in the 1600s. So they, the, the company itself, though, um, if you think about it, started an industry, an industry that, that went on for 300 years. Uh, and in equivalent of today's dollars, uh, billions and billions of dollars of, of furs crossed the Atlantic with that HB stamp on the, on the fur pelts. Uh, so if you think about it, they, the company itself, they, they seem to be quite reluctant to move into the interior, relying on the natives to bring the furs out, which made sense from an economic point of view. But that allowed the competition and some major competitions like the Northwest Company to, uh, for lack of a better word, to flank them on the interior, um, leading to a lot of conflicts. So the time for harvesting furs, um, and we can, we can, this whole industry, if you think about it, is all of a simple thing called a hat. So over there in Europe, they like these beaver felt hats. It became so trendy that the aristocrats and the people to do that, that, that wanted this fashion, and it kept changing, drove this industry. Uh, so the time for harvesting those pelts is fall, winter. The plumes are prime then. 
And in the summertime, the indigenous people would bring those pelts into a trading post or a factory, and they would trade them for metal, metal objects, uh, tools, uh, copper pots. Uh, textiles was actually the biggest, biggest uh, trade item, uh, muskets, uh, foodstuffs. The sad part is it, it actually destroyed the indigenous culture in this continent. Uh, so you can, you can understand their want of these things. It made life a lot easier for them, but it would also change their entire, uh, lifestyle, if you would, and, and the way they got, got, got on. They, it also caused conflicts because now in the search for more furs, they would travel outside of their traditional hunting grounds or their territory, if you would, into other indigenous territories, which caused problems. Anyway, we fast forward to about 17, I believe it was 1774, Hudson Bay realized that, uh, Hudson Bay Company realized that they were losing too much uh, business to these interior companies, particularly the Northwest Company. So they started an aggressive campaign to move into the interior, causing more conflicts. And that even spilled into a small battle that happened somewhere up there in the Northwest Territories on the Mackenzie River Basin and as far west as the, uh, as the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and it wasn't until 1821 when the two companies merged into one, and that would be the Hudson Bay Company, and it's still around today, and uh, it's still selling their iconic blanket in, in, in stores all over the world. Anyway, a wee bit of history there. So right now at this moment, I can think of no 
better place I'd rather be sitting than right here on my three-legged stool in front of this beautiful fire. And I thought today I'd talk a wee bit about uh, the history of cast iron. So the first, um, the first artifacts um, of cast iron were found in 5th century China, and they were rather crude cooking vessels. And it takes almost a thousand years, so we're into the 15th century, when the French cast the first cannons made of cast iron. I'm not sure that was a good thing from uh, the sense of world peace. Um, but it takes another hundred years before it becomes quite commonplace. And this morning before I struck fire, you saw me put our fire back in the back of the chimney. So rather a plain one. Um, but it served two purposes at the time, particularly in the 15th century when the materials used in chimney construction were pretty inferior. It protected uh, the chimney and the hearth, and it also reflected heat back into the dwelling. So those were the primary reasons. But as it becomes more commonplace, and you're making everything from pots to plowshares, and it's readily available, um, firebacks became pretty much the norm. They were no, no longer needed by the time we get to the 18th century, because the materials now uh, are quite, quite good and quite structurally sound. But it still served that purpose of reflecting heat into the room. But there, in colonial America, there, a, a parlor fireplace was never truly complete uh, unless it had a fire back in it. And they went from that, that practical function of, of it to an, an ornate, um, if you were affluent, to show off a little bit. So they would have them sand casted with uh, elaborate designs, floral patterns, and often even coat of arms. And I suspect they, they liked the summertime when they didn't have to have a fire and they'd have their servants polish that up. So mm, visiting guests in the parlor could admire their coat of arms in the back of the fireplace. Now I've got a wonderful um, bed of coals now going here and I'm, I'm going to bake myself up some sourdough bread. Uh, from starter we've been using for a number of years and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a wee bit about the history of that too. I'm going to get it started. So ancient uh, food historians, and, and yes, there are people that call themselves that, um, are still debating to this day the origins of leavened bread. Um, but most would agree that it dates to Egypt. So Egyptians knew both the process of making beer and the process of baking bread. So essentially it's, it's the, the, the flour or the dough that, that firm, is in a fermentation process with wild yeast from the air. Uh, some even say from the baker's hand. And some of these starters, they're called starters that you start the bread process from, um, are hundreds of years old. And one example I can think of, um, well, before I get to that, in, during the gold rush in, in California in 1849, the French bakers brought over sourdough. And that, that sourdough starter eventually made its way, if we go fast forward a bit, to the year 1889 and the gold rush in the Klondike. Um, and there's, there's one that can actually be traced where it made its way from Seattle, Washington, um, to Alaska, over the Chillicoot Pass, into the Yukon and Dawson City on the Klondike. And the, the descendant of the P, P, the people who brought that starter, she still lives in, in the Yukon, and she's still making bread from that same starter that's over 120 years old. So, in fact, the word sourdough was, was uh, given to miners 
who, who had overwintered one year in the gold fields. It's essentially, to be called a sourdough is sort of like a badge of honor for them. Anyway, I've got mine baking. Let's see if I got it in my recipe right. So it's, it's one part starter, one part water, uh, about four, four cups uh, of flour, uh, a little bit of oil, and a pinch of salt. And uh, yeah, we stretch that when we're, we're kneading the dough about every hour for about five or six hours. And then we let it rise overnight, and uh, then we bake it for about an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, after my uh, week in the bush um, uh, with no provisions last week, um, this is going to be a treat. So I didn't starve on that, on that expedition. I did pretty good, actually. I uh, lost a few pounds. But uh, I ate pretty good, uh, but not nearly as good as I'm going to eat now that I'm back to my little cabin here. And, uh, yeah, I can smell that bread bacon as I speak here. So while I'm waiting for my bread to bake and I'm getting a tad hungry, um, I thought I'd uh, finish up this bag I've been working on. Um, and, and I brought out a bunch of things that I shot. I thought I might be able to demonstrate that they didn't leave the boring, mundane life that we think. So for three months of the year, um, they were pretty busy. Spring, summer, fall, they had to get everything needed to sustain them through winter. But once winter came, they were able to exercise their artistic side, I guess, if you would. And they liked to demonstrate that, to show some, sort of their uniqueness and their skills. So the bag I'm working on is, is a reproduction but the beads that I've just sewn on right here, they're a real bit of history. So these are Venetian glass beads and, and they're, they, like I say, they're real history. They, they're circa late 1700s, early 1800s. And you can see the different colors. There's no conformity in shape or size. Um, so I've actually attached to this reproduction some real history. And it's just a great feeling when I'm out there trekking around. So it's pretty mind-boggling the skill set that our ancestors had. So they were blacksmiths, they would forge their own knives, uh, they were silversmiths, they were tinsmiths. If they had horses or oxen, they were farriers, they were seamstresses. Um, but like I said, they like to demonstrate that, um, that sort of artistic side. So they'd learn things from indigenous peoples like quill work, like dyed quill work and uh, brain tanning of hides. Um, but they didn't just have a, a, a practical purpose. As I said, they liked the, a bit of flair to it. So scrimshine is a classic example. So this is simply a powder horn. It carries the powder that feeds the musket that brings home the meat. But if we have a close look at this, um, this scrimshaw, you can see the amount of work required. And I have another piece right here that I'm currently working on where I'm, this is going to be a planer one. And I've tried to scrimshaw in a bounding deer on it. I'm trying to keep this kind of simple. It goes with my persona. And sort of the time period, uh, mid 1700s, French and Indian War period. Also this horn. I mean, it can, it simply holds char cloth above my fire mantle, but, it, but we finish them off nicely and, um, and add some scrimshaw to them as well. So the, the women of the time period, um, they, they were the glue that held the family together, literally. Um, they were responsible for the cooking, the cleaning, the child rearing, um, as well as keeping everyone clothed. And imagine they didn't have sewing machines. Everything was done with hand, needle and thread. Um, they made things like the woolen stockings. They'd knit woolen mitts. Um, then, then they get sort of artistic sometimes, and if they had the material, they would they would crochet, and they might add that to mm, fixtures in the house, or uh, they might sew that to bits of their attire um, to sort of trim it up a little bit. Some of the plain stuff they had. Quilting was was a, a practical way of using all that to use linen and cotton and fabric that had been worn out in work clothes and trousers and shirts and such. And they would they'd take that, and from a practical point of view, they turn that into a, literally a work of art. And I, and I look at the quilting, and I look at hand stitching of quilts. And the rule of thumb, I believe, was 10 stitches to the inch. And for a fellow who's not doing any with needle and thread, that's just mind-boggling, because there are literally, I, I'm, I'm assuming, thousands, if not tens of thousands of inches to, to cover a full-size quilt. 
Anyway, I can smell that uh, sourdough bread cooking and uh, I'm going to grind, uh, grind up some coffee, some of my roasted coffee beans there and make myself a cup. Okay, that's a tad disappointing. So um, <laughs> that was going to be the perfect loaf of sourdough. And uh, yeah, I went out there and started talking about crafts and such that the pioneers did. And I spoiled my breakfast. Anyway, I'm going to go make that cup of coffee. So, burnt my last one to a crisp, so I'm going to bake myself up another one, and this time I'm going to do it right. I'll be checking it a little more often, a little less baking time. 